Hello and very welcome. Thank you for joining this Liber 2021 online session called Dynamic Digital Collection. Uh, my name is Anna London and I work at the National Library of Sweden as the head of division for research collaboration and I'm also part of the Liber program committee since 2014. So very welcome to this session. We will start with some, some housekeeping rules. So let me show you uh, this slide and remind you of that we will be running a live Q&A uh, session at the end when after all the presenters have given their talk. If you want to ask a question, please send it through uh, to the chat box in the chat window at any time. Uh, and it's helpful for us if you tell us which presenter the question is for. Following this online conference, you will receive a link to a survey and we uh, welcome your feedback. So we would be happy if you fill it out. Finally, if you miss anything, don't worry. We are recording this session and we'll send you the recording and the slides after the session finishes. So let me now introduce you to our session. Uh, we will start with uh, getting a presentation uh, from Lisa Maria Napere from the National Library of Finland. And she will talk about their DOM project that has increased understanding between researchers and the National Library of Finland. Uh, after that, uh, we will hear Constance Rinaldo from the Biodiversity Heritage Library in the US and Jane Smith from the Natural History Museum in London talking about the Biodiversity Heritage Library, overcoming and preempting COVID limitations. Last but not least, uh, we will hear a talk about resounding libraries, the transformation of the Ton Koopman collection into an open digital resource for artistic research given by Bruno Forman from the Orpheus Institute in Belgium. Uh, this is the second consecutive year that the Liber delivers its annual conference online in an effort to bring our community together while also remaining safe. We hope this session will run smoothly, but we ask for your patience in any case of any technical glitches. And now I'm happy to turn the stage over to Lisa Maria Napere from the National Library of Finland to talk about the DOM project. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna, for your kind introduction and good day, everyone. My name is Lisa Napara and I come from the National Library of Finland. And it's a great pleasure to be a part of this interesting conference. I'm a project manager in the project called Digital Open Memory. It focuses on developing data-driven research services at the National Library of Finland. My presentation title here suggests that the project increases the understanding between resources and the National Library of Finland. The project has two-year funding from the European Regional Development Foundation. The regional connection is in South Savo, where the National Library digitizes analog materials and develops the user interface dc.nationallibrary.fi. We do collaboration with the local University of Applied Sciences in this project. The National Library's work package focuses on user-driven information. Our main aim in the project is to develop research services, especially from data and user-driven perspectives. Another aim is to understand resources needs for digital collections and indirectly to increase resources knowledge of what kind of digital collections and services are available at the library. This presentation focuses on some gaps found in understanding between resources and the National Library. After recognizing them, the collaboration and providing research services should be easier. We have collected three types of information, survey, interviews, and participant observation to understand better the uses of our digital collections. In a survey, we ask how resources had used our digital collections and what kind of needs they have for them. The main findings were that the digital historical newspapers were the most popular 
and users wanted more open materials and better OCR quality. During the interviews, the aim was to get more detailed description, what do they need for digital collections and if they need any research services around them. For example, information, searching, improvements and more interaction with the library were mentioned. And lastly, the participant observation focuses more on the practical side of each ongoing research project. For example, what kind of data set was needed, among other tailor-made support for research. In addition to the user-driven information collection, we also benchmark other national libraries and ask what kind of research services they have created around their digital collections and data. You can read more about benchmarking from the report that is listed in references if you are interested how we interview people from library labs. This presentation focuses mostly on collaboration with researchers. Therefore, I also say something about my research position. I have background in cultural studies and before this project, uh, I studied digital discourse in Finnish primary schools in order to do my doctoral dissertation. So I have very much humanistic and qualitative perspective to this. However, I have no technical background and I'm aware that some have limitation when we talk about digital collections and digital methods. Another limitation is that I started my work at the National Library in January 2020, so I don't have long experience and I have still much to learn about this culture. And in a culture, and culture here must be understood in a wide sense. Soon after starting to work on the project, I found myself in the multidisciplinary context and with different approaches to digital collections. My first question was, what are digital collections and who are the resources who use them? When you think about the context of national libraries, humanity scholars are the most important, but it's also quite essential to talk about digital huma humanities nowadays. Digital humanities is often said it's a multidisciplinary field by default. However, there's a lot of discussion and it has been criticized. For example, it has been asked if it's tr truly multidisciplinary or if there are two separate fields studying something with humanistic methods and computational humanistic questions and with computational methods. And if we go more into the general level, we usually have people from, oh no, we, we have people cooperating from different educational backgrounds and expertise. And many times projects have international collaboration aspect. So everyone participating brings something unique that needs to be considered where, whether that might cause misunderstanding, even if the aim of the project and digital collections are the same. If it, look more into the challenges that multidisciplinary working environment raises following our project findings. First, there are copyrights. Demands for more open data and questions why something is not available online, even though it has been digitized or born digitally are quite common and repeated in many occasions, as we saw in our project data at every step of our information collection. The copyright knowledge seems to be somewhat inadequate among resources, even though they are aiming for ethical, sustainable research. So, National Library and other data providers are important actors to inform users about copyrights. However, the copyrights are still a complicated issue and sometimes they are an actual hindrance to conduct research because the collection is not, access not accessible enough despite its digital form. From library side, one challenge is to be able to understand research process. For example, we tried to visualize it a couple of times, but we had two traditional humanities oriented approaches than it was needed in the context of digital humanities. However, this raised a welcoming discussion to clarify unclear steps. But anyhow, there are still something to work on to understand this properly. For example, what to do concerning data and tool sustainability 
at the end of the process cycle. But probably the future project will help with this and models from others. The next important challenge for mutual understanding is vocabulary that changes in different contexts. For example, what do people mean when they talk about data? It's not consistent, not even among the representatives of the same research field. The word data can mean many things, original or raw data, either machine readable or non-machine readable. It can mean resource data, which is extracted from the or original or raw data, or data can mean archived data, which is preserved in the repository. And additionally, even though our working language is, in, is finished, we talk about data as said, but we also have a similar word, Einesto. It can be it can also translate it in the word data, but its meaning has a slight different nuance. It makes the collaboration sometimes slightly more complicated when the meanings of the same word are mixed, depending who talks and in what context. And then we have individual research cases where the needs for collections vary. Not every study is using digital methods, let alone that the materials is available digitally. For example, when, if you think about it in the white picture, GLAM organization internationally. So there are practical issues uh, of collection fairness and how different collections are not equally findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This is important if research needs both digital and analog materials, but fairness also changes between different digital materials and different states when data is used in, the, in research, either raw data, research data, or archive data. If you fo focus on with more details the needs of the users of digital collections, um, according to our project data, there are three user categories of digital collections. In the first column, you can see that the focus is on digital materials, humanities, and qualitative methods, such as close reading. Digital or technological skills are not expected to be very high, or, or users of digital materials are not interested in them, or they do not need them. Some can also be at the learning phase with methods and later move on to the next level. For example, uh, when the focus is on digital materials, the purpose is just on the database to collect information in a quite manual manner. In this category, the digital methods are expected to be something like giving keywords or do categorizations digitally. These are just a couple of examples. And there was also one case in our interviews where the researcher had printed all the materials that was found and analyzed them manually, so not di digitally at all. So digital materials are more important than methods in this first category. The second column is the most difficult one to define and it's probably the largest one. There are some researchers in humanities who have some methodological skills and they are able to do quantitative and qualitative analysis, but the emphasis can be said on mostly on the qualitative side. It's because the digital and technological skills are still somehow lacking. However, it is expected here that they can use, for example, ready-made datasets and some advanced ready-made tool, analyzing tools. They may even understand something about code and how does it work, but they are not necessarily making the code by themselves. In the third column, the emphasis is more on digital methods and qualitative analysis of data with advanced digital and technological skills. Users of digital materials and data in this category are expected to develop their own algorithms and tools to analyze data. They can do text and da data mining and otherwise handle big data masses. 
However, it's important to note that categories are flexible and depending on the resource setting and needed digital skills in each resource project. Not every resource setting needs advanced tools and algorithms, even though they operate with the same digital materials. And on the other hand, when I analyzed the data, advanced skills were not as common as we expected. For example, according to our survey, about 27% of researchers had used text and data mining, but during interviews, it was not that simple. There was a case where researchers themselves did not have the skills to do text and data mining. It was conducted by somebody else, even though the researchers had the answer in the survey doing it. Actually, in this case, it was the study that needed text and data mining, and it, that's why it, the answer was like that. Of course, this do, does not mean that everyone else in the survey did not have uh, text and data mining skills, but this opens a critical approach to think about it. And concerning how few researchers with advanced skills we had in interviews, the intermediate digital and technological skills seems to be the most important category. However, the goal is set in advanced skills, but there are a lot of resources who need support just with digital materials, so it is important to offer services in a wide range. It is not always very visible that there are some gaps in understanding others when digital collections and even projects are shared. However, those gaps actualize in everyday discussions. For example, while planning the research setting or writing paper together. But understanding each other is the key point of collaboration. For example, when we think about the research services that we are developing at the National Library. Meanwhile, there's also a lot of education available, for example, virtual events, either formal or informal. They are one chance to ask and learn. They are also part of information sharing, but the technical knowledge will most likely to become visible just by doing the project together with different people have, who have their own background. In this project, we have increased the understanding of one user group needs for our digital collections. We are most we are mostly likely we are most likely to be able to co collaborate and communicate with the resources and to be able to take into account the different users of digital collections. However, there seems to be still some work to do with many things such as copyright knowledge. Uh, data archiving and sustainable tool standards. So collaboration and communication with the users of our digital collections continues because knowledge increases step by step as we do more projects together with resources as a part of redefined research services. Here are some references, and if you have any comments or questions, I will gladly answer them at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Very, very interesting. And we will, uh, as you said, have a Q&A at the end. So uh, let me now uh, welcome Constance Rinaldo and Jane Smith, who will talk about the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Uh, overcoming and preempting COVID limitation. The floor is yours. Thank you. My name is Connie Ronaldo and Jane Smith. Sorry, and I... Connie, uh, we are seeing the presentation view of your presentation and not the audience view. I think you want to change that setting. I'm sorry. It's no worries. It happens to all of us. View. Um, well, I can. I can fix that easily. <laughs> anyway, so um, thank you for having us to talk about the BHL and how we manage the pandemic. And I want to thank all of my colleagues who you see on this slide. Um, Jane Smith, they, uh, Jane Smith will be speaking. Thank you, Jane Smith will be speaking and um, David Eagleden, Elisa Herman and Colleen Funkhauser. Um, are also probably well, either in the audience or have worked really hard on this as well. So 
sorry, Constance, but we still see the presentation view of your presentation. And I uh, think you don't want us to see your notes. <laughs> no, but I would like to see my notes, but it's yes. not, I don't know why it's, I don't know why it's not working. Do we have some technical help for Connie otherwise? I apologize. We did practice this and I'd hope to try it out this morning. Okay, so I'm starting again. Um, I won't repeat the introduction, but we really appreciate being here to talk about the Biodiversity Library um, for many of our colleagues, um, our BHL partners and the colleagues listed here all contributed significantly to this, to this presentation. Next slide. Today we'll be setting the context, tell you what BHL is, how we operated during the pandemic, um, talk about the value and impact that our users discussed um, it directly in reflections from them. And we'll show you that BHL has this collective resilience, which has allowed us to build on lessons learned for future developments. Next slide. The Biodiversity Heritage Library is the world's largest open access digital library for biodiversity literature and archives. Next slide. That may sound a tiny bit esoteric. Um, so we have this digital library. Why is it important? Um, it contains a critical mass of material that scientists need to support their research and address today's critical problems of biodiversity, the biodiversity crisis, climate change, and it opens all of this to the world. So we have a large open knowledge community. BHL doesn't just contain heritage literature, as you can see, see noted here. We work with rights holders to make sure that there's copyrighted material available as much as possible um, and open to the world. Next slide, please. BHL is a global consortium. Um, it consists of natural history, botanical, and academic libraries around the world, and we work together to make sure that we're digitizing the materials that our scientists and other users need and making them freely available. Next slide, please. BHL's natural ecosystem is, is what present, was presented during the pandemic. These are our strengths and and this is what allowed us to continue to operate successfully and provide important services to our users. We've built on our World, world Consortium's 15 year history and track record. The lessons and experiences from the pandemic period are being fed into future ways of working and developing relevant content and services going forward. We collaborate virtually on a day-to-day -day basis. Our common aim is to be part of the opening up of science, and this forms the basis of BHL. The wider benefit of our collaboration is that our activities and content support open culture and open knowledge. We've built collective resilience through sharing practice, sharing technical expertise, and sharing the effort of building and maintaining content. Next slide. One of the key issues here, or the most important things, is that BHL is built on a strong infrastructure. We've had seamless and continued access because this, this, there was already a strong foundation in place, this established infrastructure, which has been developed over the last 15 years. There's a roadmap for development, and we already had this in place. User feedback, communication, and professional support are an important part of the backbone of BHL. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the value and Im impact of BHL during the pandemic through the eyes of our users in, in particular. Again, why is this digital library important? Well, the material that scientists need to support research addressing critical problems is found in BHL. It was clear that the value and impact for partners and all users during the pandemic was enormous. The BHL enabled scientists and citizen scientists and anyone else to continue work on understanding the natural world and finding solutions for the global challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss, as well as address directly some of the issues related to the pandemic. Next slide, please. Researchers have shared how BHL has been one of the key factors enabling them to continue their work during COVID. Despite limited or no access to their print and specimen collections, which are critical to their work or their laboratories. 
Some, some e quick comments include resources like this make all the difference and BHL has got me covered. Next slide, please. None of us can imagine the backlog of work that we would have faced had we not been able to access this fantastic resource. We're very grateful for this service and could not do without it. Next slide. Infra this, is, I, this is important and addresses a question um, that I think may come up. Information inequality between developing and developed world researchers can be narrowed with BHL. Next slide, please. A number of users have shared more about their research and the use of BHL, particularly during the pandemic, um, via the BHL users blog. So feel free to take a look at that and, um, and see, what other, see in depth what others say. Next slide, please. The result is really that BHL simply allowed work to continue. Um, David Igledon at Kew Gardens um, heard this quite a lot, as did many, many of the rest of us um, in the BHL partnership. We heard versions of this statement from many of our users over the last 15 months. Throughout this presentation, we want to show BHL's changes over the years, review some of the successes, and identify possible future challenges And as we continue to stress the relevance of this resource beyond biodiversity. Next slide, please. We want to talk a little bit about collective resilience and what it means and the lessons learned and as we move forward. Next slide, please. Recently, a biologist noted that in biodiversity, scientists often just measure diversity, not complexity. But he also noted that if complexity is measured, the combination often results in resiliency. This is mirrored in the growth that we've seen in BHL and the development over the 15 years that we have been working together. Complexity as measured by the diversity and number of partners has increased and overall the positive effect is resiliency and flexibility. BHL is still robust after 15 years. Next slide, please. Because there was less on-site digitization with most work being done remotely, content growth was slower than, this, than over this past year, but you can see that it didn't stop. Content uploads continued with born digital content and also the addition of content that had been waiting to be uploaded. For example, our partner in Paris, the Museum of Natural History there, was able to dedicate staff full-time to uploading content as part of telework projects they added more than 100,000 pages of content in 2020. Next slide, please. Identifying scientific names is one of the foundational needs of BHL core researchers. Scientific names are critical links, provide critical net metadata for historical context for museum specimens, for instance, and are also important in open knowledge settings, such as in citizen science projects and other biodiversity um, other other um, organizations of biodiversity, such as the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, also known as GBIF. The scientific names extracted show high growth consistently, and, and you can see that, that uh, if anyone's interested in scientific names, they might be interested in what's happening in BHL. Next slide, please. User growth has been consistent over the 15 years, as you can see from the bottom image. Um, the shorter inset gives you just a flavor of the, the, the sharp increase in 2020. Um, the early growth is actually due to some, some great publicity, um, some outreach efforts and, and those kinds of activities. But later on, it still continued. The growth continued because of lockdown and this increase in reliance on digital resources, particularly DHL, was echoed by all of our partners. Next slide, please. So really, um, this, this person says, BHL supercharges the speed and efficiency of scholarly research. And you can see that the comments that we've selected show how individuals have found value for BHL um, for their research and how it helped them keep going through lockdown. 
The BHL has a critical mass of content and this content serves this, the needs of scientific researchers and the institutions in which they work. So what was the experience of BHL institutions and what did BHL work on during the pandemic? I'm gonna turn it over to Jane Smith now for the final threads. Okay, th thank you, Connie. Um, I wonder if we could do a quick handover so I can, um, uh, so that you could share your screen instead of me, if that's all right. Sure. Sorry for the delay, everybody. <laughs> we'll give it a try again. <clears throat> but let me try to um, get us to the right spot so that we're not wasting that time. Jane, you could maybe turn on your camera too so we can yeah, see you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I don't have permission to turn on my camera. Yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> then we need some technical help, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, that's great. <laughs> and I just can't even find, oh, there it is. Why okay, it, well, I'm, while we're waiting, so thank you, Connie, and hello, everyone. Um, Connie has talked about the impact of BHL for our users over the last 15 years, and particularly during the months of the pandemic. I'd like to move on to talk about the experiences of our BHL partners and how those experiences are influencing the next phase of development for BHL. I think we're still waiting for, for the next slide. So um, at our... Um, uh, BHL virtual annual meeting in April this year, we carried out a virtual tour of the room to find out what were the experiences and lessons learned from within our home institutions and across the BHL partners. There were many similarities, but also some differences in what each focused on, depending on how lockdowns or necessary on-site restrictions were implemented locally. And I'd like to share with you uh, two of the main themes that came through that exercise. The first theme emphasised how BHL is very much a part of the digital shift or the digital transformation of how generally we are all working now, researching and studying. The second relates to the value of BHL to the individual partners, as well as for joint working across institutions and thereby supporting international initiatives in biodiversity but also the wider public value of BHL for those seeking information and understanding of the natural world and the history of science. Next slide, please. So um, as, as these quotes from our partner reps show, and as I'm sure we are all aware across all of our sectors, the pandemic period has highlighted the importance of access from any location to resources, expertise and services digitally. User experiences of working in different locations away from the usual workplace, uh, teaching and collaborating virtually rather than face to face, needing reliable internet access and the need for credible sources have supported the escalation of the digital transformation in how we work. The experience of, of BHL partners has also reflected this escalation of the digital environment and reinforced and highlighted the importance of the work we are collectively doing already in making biodiversity literature available for use and reuse. Next slide, please. So again, our, our partner reflections show that because of the organisation and infrastructure already in place and that Connie's already related, uh, relayed, BHL enabled uninterrupted access globally throughout the pandemic. Um, and that's important because the older literature and original material from our institutional collections on biodiversity, particularly that can contain species data and descriptions is as relevant as the recently published work. And the feedback from our partners is that the content in BHL is essential to that scientific research and exploration. Digital resources are no longer just nice to have in addition to print resources. And the virtual access to primary and unique source material is increasingly essential for that research. The commitment of BHL partners to escalate the sharing of those resources and enhancing them for wider discoverability was even more evident during this pandemic period. 
Next slide, please. So moving on to the second theme of the value of BHL, our partners also emphasize that digital resources like BHL are more valuable than ever. BHL formed a key part of service provision at institutional level, as well as collectively providing an expert network supporting the global science research communities we all serve. BHL is valued and recognized by those research communities, but increasingly by wider cultural and humanities academic communities. And why is that? It's not just because we are enabling access to library and archive collections that are held in institutions across the world that are related to one another and to the associated specimen collections. It is how we are enabling that content to be used by scientists and researchers to work more rapidly across disciplines and therefore impact that research capability to find solutions for local and global challenges around planetary health and human health. And we are making that content discoverable to new and wider cultural and public audiences. Next slide, please. Another quote from our colleagues in BHL Australia, um, that the value lies in the enhancement of the content in BHL to make it as discoverable and usable as possible. Overall, the connectedness and community support of our partnership allowed us all to go further in improving access for our local as well as global users. Some partners continue to digitize and add content during the pandemic. For those partners that were not able to continue collection digitization due to local lockdowns, many turned to projects to enhance metadata that improved discoverability of the existing content that was prioritized by our users. This work included adding page level metadata for improved navigation, adding article metadata, and assigning DOIs to help bring the historic literature into the modern linked network of scholarly research. We also workshop through ways in which we can address and begin to contextualize the more historically sensitive material in BHL or that we would over time like to include in the future. So I've mentioned experiences across the partners uh, was very varied. I'd, I'd like now to move on to some very specific examples. Next slide, please. So starting with Elisa Herman's example from the Museum for Natakunda in Berlin, her museum has opened or closed according to the local pandemic situation in Berlin. It's currently open to visitors, but closed to researchers. So BHL and open access literature has been vital for their information supply. Their library staff work focused on documentation and revision of existing workflows to make them more efficient and adapted to modern practice. They have worked through backlog tasks, including uploading digital scans to BHL. Post pandemic, they plan to expand their digital services to focus on acquisitions um, for electronic resources and revise traditional workflows and concentrate staff training on digital and technical skills. Next slide, please. At the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew, the example from David Diggledon, the Botanical Gardens opened to visitors um, long before museums were able to open their galleries. Digital access has been important throughout the pandemic for their science staff who have been mostly working from home. Going forward, they are planning for an increase in digitization, including how they contribute to BHL. Next slide, please. The Smithsonian example provided by Colleen Fonkhauser and her colleague Jacqueline Chapman shares how BHL helped support the work of the Smithsonian library staff. Digitization stopped in March 2020, and the library team needed to uh, move swiftly to remote working. BHL offered um, an opportunity for library staff to contribute to metadata enhancement projects. As Connie's already shared, the infrastructure of BHL supported such a swift change to remote work because BHL uses a cloud-based system, has an issue tracking system to work collectively on projects provides clear documentation to train and support new staff, and has collective pri priorities from the consortia to help prioritize the work. So BHL's natural ecosystem that Connie described helps support teleworking projects. Next slide, please. The final example is from my own institution, the Natural History Museum in London. 
The museum closed with the lockdown and has reopened gradually. BHL access has been a key element in a range of services delivered to both internal and external users throughout the pandemic, whether they've been working at home, back on site or in the field. Collection digitisation was interrupted as staff moved to working from home and so work uh, switched to uh, a number of metadata and enhancement projects, including those on, BA on the BHL list. The museum is building a new science and collection centre at Harwell throughout this period. So uh, going forward, the escalation of, of digitisation of collections and digitisation of the library continues to be a priority. Next slide, please. So moving on to the future, um, we launched a new strategic plan in 2020 and have been working on an implementation plan to deliver that five year strategy throughout the last 18 months. The plan incorporates all the lessons from our users and from our partners feedback during the pandemic period. So elements of the plan have been reprioritized to take into account what we now know and events that have emphasised the importance of steps already in progress to enhance the metadata, address social justice and the historical context of our collections and content, how we will work in a more diverse and inclusive way. We have also had time to explore new technology initiatives. Through the plan, we want to build on our virtualness and interconnectivity that have supported the collective resiliency of BHL. Next slide, please. So to pick out uh, just a, a few more of, of those points in detail, our strategy includes six core goals to deliver the next five years of our development. These top line goals were already written and during the, uh, the, the COVID period, we have been setting the priorities for implementation. One of those areas has been how we incorporate across all the goals um, that we address social justice and inclusion and diversity. And critically, how do we address the historical context of the content and the related physical collections with uh, working with communities, both within and outside our existing current science and academic partners? So some of these areas relate to um, developing relevant content and reviewing our collection policy how we continue to develop tools and services such as name finding and persistent identifiers and extended, uh, extending our specimen network. How do we work with our user communities to leverage that global partners and, and widen the audiences for that content? How we work with our partners and, and build alliances to extend collaborations but beyond science. And a crucial element is around our mission and enabling so that we continue to build uh, a sustainable model and continue to provide meaningful value for our partners. Next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, BHL has proved to be successful throughout the pandemic for our institutions and for our users because we are actively planning for future developments. We have built in versatility. We have an ongoing technical roadmap. Our core focus remains on science, science challenges and open science approaches. But we are aware of the wider value of our content as a cultural resource and how we can support broader open knowledge. A significant strength is that BHL has developed as more than a digital library. It aligns local and global missions for biodiversity. It is a data resource constantly evolving, responsive to its user communities. It is a joint effort sharing costs, knowledge and standards. We form a professional network of natural history, botanical and research libraries and archives, sharing knowledge and expertise and support. Our key strength is our community network, our openness to new approaches and ideas that we continue to be as relevant and responsive. Thank you. I hope you found this interesting and if there are any questions, do feed them through. Thank you so much, both Constance and Jane for presenting such an impressive open digital library and it's important during the pandemic.
Uh, let us now move uh, forward to our last uh, presentation, and it will be given by Bruno Formon from the Orpheus Institute in Belgium, and he will be giving a speech about resounding libraries, the transformation of the Ton Copeman collection into an open digital resource for artistic research. The floor is yours, Bruno. Thank you, Anna. But first of all, uh, you will have to give me possibility to start video. Let's okay. get some technical and help for that. Started. Thank you. Invisible. And now I will share my screen. And can you please confirm that you are seeing my presentation? Yes, it looks perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning. It's an honor to be here, especially coming from a brand new member to Libre. We're only members since a year or so. We're a small institution, so but very proud to jo be joining this uh, great network. Private libraries may not be associated readily with open knowledge, reflecting the bibliophile dreams of an individual whose collecting habits can be quirky and his cataloging standards all the quirkier. Private libraries are likely to be appreciated more as historical or biograph biographical time capsules than as generators of future knowledge. The case of the Tom Coleman collection proves quite the opposite. As I will explain in this presentation, this musician's library provides an ideal testing ground for new practices in content discovery and open science within the relatively young discipline of artistic research in music. After sketching the library's background, acquisition and relocation, I will lift the curtain over its user-generated metadata and ongoing work to transform this un unique asset into an open digital resource. First of all, who is Ton Koopman? The first recipient ever to obtain two Prix d'Excellence in music in the Netherlands, this former harpsichord student of Gustav Leonhardt emerged in the 1970s as a figurehead of historically informed performance in classical music. Quite everything Koopman is energetic and superlative, starting with his discography, which numbers over 240 releases and which includes the complete vocal words of Johann Sebastian Bach. At 76, Koopman is still traveling around the globe, conducting orchestras, playing harpsichords and organs, giving master classes, publishing articles, organizing a festival in France, presiding over the Bach Archive in Leipzig, and so on. In keeping with this unremitting activity, Koopman buys and reads books as if his life depends on it. He purchased his first collectible volume at 13 only, some six decades later, he has amassed over 350 running meters of literature, including some 5,000 early printed editions and 400 manuscripts next to well over 11,000 modern books and scores pertaining to the music, arts, and history of the Baroque. The highlights in this collection are as daunting as its size, and one could go on forever naming unique exemplars, signed editions, annotated copies, beautiful curiosities. Yet in spite of these attractions, Orpheus Institute initially said no to the offer of acquiring the library. Orpheus does not foster the ambition to become a documentation center about whatever musician or branch of music scholarship. Founded a quarter of a century ago as a center for advanced studies and artistic research in music, Orpheus does not put a written record central in its endeavors, but focuses on the musical act itself. Research at Orpheus is carried out by and for musicians who of course rely on books and scores for their scholarly work, but whose questions and methods are determined foremost by artistic concerns and concepts. It was only upon discovering the unique asset of Koopman's library that the Institute started a quest for the infrastructure and funding necessary to acquire it. And that feature is a set of handwritten keywords and indices the owner and user provided to the collection. Almost each volume indeed contains an index of keywords, followed by page numbers referring to passages Koopman found noteworthy written on separate slips of paper in the case of the old books or directly into the front matter of modern exemplars, each index constitutes a genuine knowledge map, translating textual, musical, 
and iconographic content into idiosyncratic but consistent concepts. Some keywords are straightforward topical terms or personal and geographic names, yet many others represent higher level semantic concepts and ongoing research questions in historically informed performance in music. Assume, for instance, you're a young musician looking for a treatise or method that tells you by which instruments and in how many voices a basso continuo was played out in Rome at the end of the 17th century. No matter how effective, no matter method of optical character recognition will be able to retrieve the answers directly from the page, simply because the requested terms were not in use in the period at hand. They are 20th century paraphrases of plurized symbolic matters that can be represented through text with shift in vocabulary, notated music, engravings, and so on. Moreover, many concepts are fundamentally multidisciplinary. Think of Koopman's term Zuiverheid, purity, a notion with overlapping music technical, aesthetic, and philosophical implications ranging from correct intonation and tuning over timbral clarity to classicism. Before explaining how these handwritten keywords are being transformed into a digital discovery system, I will first offer you some ideas about the collection's physical organization and the need to also reorganize it. For decades, Coleman's library used to be located at his own house, where it was managed by a personal librarian, a musicologist. Convinced of the importance to record the library's last appearance on site as faithfully as possible, I drove up to Copeman's house in December 2019 to photograph and measure the collection shelf by shelf while interrogating the musician and his librarian about their daily retrieval and perusal of the books and scores. Meanwhile, in Ghent, extensive remodeling was carried out at the library's destination, the former coach house of Hotel Dan Steenhuize, in the heart of Ghent. Hotel Danestenese is a mid 18th century palace that hosted visits of a Tsar, an American president and a French king. In July, 2020, the Coleman collection was relocated to three spaces of the building, each having glass cupboards with LED strips that have the volumes bathed in an atmospheric footlight, not unlike Baroque theaters. The coach house being a protected site Far-ranging measures were ex executed with respect to the infrastructure. One room is now coined Pyramid Hall on account of its conspicuous timber roof. It will henceforth serve as a presentation venue for the Institute's concerts and lectures, with the books serving as a grand decor. The heritage part of the collection is housed in three conditioned camera monitor cells with a carbon dioxide system and um, and RFID tags helping pr to protect and retrieve all books. Yet in order not to impair the optical quality of the historical volumes, we decided to clothe the tags in tan washi paper before gluing them in with water solvent adhesives and papers. And no indications are made on the spine uh, to not to impair those bindings. The modern books proved to be in a state of near disarray upon their arrival. For years, shelves had been filled according to mere acquisition with a simple placing system telling users where the right volume was located. A study on 17th century organ music could thus appear next to, a, say, a catalog of paintings, a description of an instrument, a history of musical life somewhere, sometime. Since the existing Orpheus Library collections had also become fuzzy after several donations, with books on similar subjects appearing in different rooms or vice versa, it was decided to reorganize all holdings into 19 thematic collections divided over the Institute's main seat, two houses away, and the coach house. So far, the physical aspects enters the digital part. The antiquated feel and limited functionality of the catalogs deployed at both Copeland's house and at Orpheus compelled us to migrate all records to an alternative system, the open source Koha, which is now exporting its data to the Ghent Catalog of Scientific Libraries, a project of Ghent University, and the Belgian Unicat. Up and running since last spring, our new catalog is offering abundant possibilities for analysis, metadata enrichment, and cleanup. A former master catalog catalographer helps us translate the functional requirements for bibliographic records 
into a workable cataloging framework for all bibliographic and authority records. Speaking of authority records, we began transcribing and structuring Koopman's keywords into a master index, a simple spreadsheet containing the raw transcription of each original term in one column with the shelf mark and page numbers next to it, and then another column holding the controlled vocabulary version for each term. At present, this file contains over 17,000 rows relating to the old prints and manuscripts. We're far from done, of course, and many authorities still require further definition and clean up. While migrating our old catalogs to Koha, our ILS provider had imported authority records from Library of Congress, but we soon found these wanting in consistency and logic, while also going against the grain of knowledge production in the Baroque, the core area of the Coatman collection. This warrants some explanation. 17th and 18th century composers developed virtual or literal libraries of musical ideas we would now call sound bites, musical motives, chord progressions, topics, which they then re redeveloped into their compositions. This practice has been often mentioned in terms of citing, as in Handel's case, for example, but it was more intricate than that. 17th and 18th century discourse, whether in literature, the arts, or sciences, consists in chopping up and recombining units. Think of Descartes and Leibniz. Small units were differentiated, categorized, and mapped onto gigantic tableaus according to rationalist rules of logic, grammar, and order. This Baroque system of knowledge composition corresponded less with tabular databases, such as the Mark system, than with modern knowledge graphs whose nodes engage in free relationships across network universes of non-hierarchical concepts. Based on this insight, we began atomizing, so to speak, or Koha thesaurus in order to have it serve a dual purpose. On the one hand, to contain the authority records on which the catalog metadata are built, and second, to provide access points for the entities in our controlled vocabulary of the Koopman keywords. A big transformation was inevitable since the LOC authorities and Koopman's original indices deployed pre-coordinated combinations of concepts with the typical headings and subdivisions. We are systematically deconstructing these convoluted terms into singular entities. Each of these discrete terms is then linked, linked to Wikidata to ensure machine readability, fair data compliance, unlimited definition, linking and aggregation across various data sets. On the document side, we started building a digital repository with IIIF manifestos. This protocol allows us, first of all, to forgo integral digitization of those volumes with handwritten indices inside, which is an operation our institute simply cannot afford. Instead, we are making prof profitable use of other institutions' digitizing efforts for those 40-something percent of items that can now already be accessed on the web. IIIF will furthermore enable us to not just bookmark the pages linked to, to Koopman's keywords, but also tell the system that image map X pertains to keyword Y. And this is maybe what the keynote speaker referred to as a finer type of DOI that, is, that can be uh, created. By way of illustration, imagine you are looking at the title page of an 18th century sonata that can already be found online with a IIIF manifesto. Koopman indicated the iconographic representation of a violin, which is also mentioned in words in Italian translation, violino. The violone mentioned in the title is more ambiguous in that it can mean either violoncello or double bass in that period, although the engraving suggests the former bass string. The expression violone or cimbalo in the title is all the more interesting in that it supposes a continuo, a compasso continuo with a boolean or in it. It's either cello or harpsichord, but not both as standard practice would have it. The title furthermore specifies timbral imitations of the viola d'amore through the use of a mute near the bridge. Coleman did of course not mark up everything element of interest on the single page. What I've shown here represents his keywords. But he was not struck, for example, by the name of the dedicatee, Principessa Anna, or Anne, Princess Royal. Nonetheless, this daughter of George II is known to have been a great harpsichordist whose violin teacher happened to be the composer of a sonata. 
So maybe they just played it together, these works. On the 25th of March, in the very year this set was published, 1734, Anne married the Dutch crown prince. And since the Coleman collection has a set of Dutch harpsichord sonatas dedicated to her in that very year, marking up the name of the dedicatee could offer an opportunity for storytelling within our library. But is it solely up to my colleagues and I to create those links and weave stories around different items? Of course it isn't. Like many present here, I believe that end users on the World Wide Web have stopped being passive users of data. They have become active participants in global processes of knowledge generation and exchange. These keen learners and contributors should be provided with accessible and reusable content through user-friendly interfaces, inviting them to enrich that content. Such participatory thinking is embedded in the working of Orpheus Institute, which does not have a dedicated librarian to start with. I am also an artist researcher. Orpheus Library Catalog is consequently perceived as a collective instrument by and for artist scholars and various colleagues have already enriched it from their backgrounds and perspectives. It's even the deal. Do you want to come visit Orpheus and work on our collections? Be ready to enrich our metadata. However, we decide to go further, allowing future users worldwide to lay self-generated scholarly content over our collection. We'd like to install edit buttons in our discovery system with which your record and keywords can be expanded and linked to external resources such as research depositories, knowledge bases, sound and video streaming, and so on. And we also have a wild dream of users worldwide creating their own indices and knowledge maps with our collection. Unfortunately, we're neither information scientists nor technology buffs, so we had to call upon a bigger neighbor to help us accomplish our dream. This is where Ghent University Library comes in. The latter saw a unique case study in our, uh, in our uh, lean and mean collection and its keywords for rebuilding of its own library ecosystem. Though I'm not in the position to expand on this exciting venture, I can already tell you it will become possible to lay custom data canvases over triple IF images while making use of, for example, our controlled thesaurus. By thus wedding the Coleman Library to classic mark cataloging, the semantic web and IIIF infrastructure, a tool is coming into existen existence with which users all over the world will be able to access, discover, and enrich our collections and its knowledge in easier ways than hitherto possible. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Bruno, for this impressive video presentation and insight into a private library. I feel I've already been there thanks to your videos. So uh, with this, I will open the Q&A sessions. Thank you to all speakers. Uh, we will now take questions. Uh, so just a reminder to our delegates, uh, please be sure to type in your question into the chat box. It looks... Um, uh, we, uh, we will uh, monitor the chat, but I will start then maybe with you, um, uh, Bruno, to ask you about the migration to an open source ILS like COA. What's your experience with this uh, migration? Do you have any tips to others that are thinking of moving to an open source ILS? Or do you have had uh, in-house competences and skills for this? Or have you used a COA consultant, for instance? Yes, to answer your last question, we used an, uh, an outhouse COA consultant in France, uh, Bip Libre, who helped us through the whole process, which we could impossibly do ourselves because we had to migrate three different uh, resources. Our old catalog at Orphis was done in a program called uh, BDOC, a Belgian program that could be exported to Mark XML. But interestingly enough, we have more work on that, on cleaning up that uh, Mark uh, XML import than on the two other resources, which were the old Allegro C um, catalog data. Allegro C was developed a long time ago at Braunschweig University. That was used at Coleman's house for the old and modern collection. So we had that exported already long before we started uh, even thinking about Koha and began to enrich it, believe it or not, in just plain Excel. 
and then exported that. And it was really helpful um, to, to already, um, uh, let's say, uh, massage the data in a way that could already anticipate the structure of Koha and, 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 its, uh, and its request, then use a ready-made Mark XML and then do all the work afterwards. So it's well to, to consider the work before migrating than having to, to clean it up afterwards. Wow, yeah, I can imagine. Uh, we are getting some technical help to get the other presenters show their camera. Uh, but Bruno, what are your experience then, pros and cons with working with a controlled vo vo vocabulary linked to a Wikidata knowledge base? How does that work? Oh, that was a, that was a quick choice uh, and that was a, um, suggested to us. Because of course, I did not really know about, I, I am a Wikipedian, but oddly enough, I did not know a lot about Wikidata. I knew about BIAF, uh, if I, the Virtual International Authority file, but what uh, annoyed me about VIF is that we do not have directly access to it. So whereas to Wikidata, if you see something that uh, bothers you, that, that, that just, you see a mistake or, or an incomplete description of a, of a person or an entity, you can just add it, you can tweak it. Uh, so it's direct access is of course an asset. It contains via numbers, you can add them or DBPD or whatever other knowledge base. On the on the negative side, I would say it does have its limitations. Of course, you uh, headings can be formulated in a way that is not completely compatible with your heading, with your keywords. Um, so uh, a typical thing is using the singular rather than the plural for uh, for genres, for example. But we adapt as much as possible to Wikidata. But we, of course, we were at the beginning of the project. We had a choice. We did not have to change, for example, VF to Wikidata. Uh, but it's it's going smoothly, and I'm quite happy with the choice. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation that you are a private library. So uh, I was wondering, do you have an open science or an open access policy within the library? Or is that something you're working on? We are absolutely involved in it. We are uh, uh, involved in the uh, European Open Science Cloud through the Flemish Open Science Board. We're very actively involved. We had already uh, give our, our zero measuring of where we are stand with KPIs like ORCIDs and open access and open science and open data, et cetera. So um, this project is really uh, helping us a lot to formulate needs because it's for a lot of scholars, it's new. Uh, it does not give them an immediate idea as to the uses of, of open data. Um, so, uh, but the project so, uh, so, sort of helps to be a guinea pig to implement open science policies and, and, and help them convince scholars, work immediately on our records. Please do not make your notes in a Word document somewhere or your EndNote reference manager, just do it in the catalog so that it can be used immediately. That is, it's of course a, a, a long path of growth towards open science. But anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question for you, Jane, from the audience. Uh, can we have more information about COVID limitations in the last year? Sure, thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, it, it has, across all of the partners, it's varied because we have partners in, in all places. Um, uh, across the world. So it has varied tremendously. But if I reflect um, the, the UK perspective in particular, um, uh, the, the Natural History Museum and the Royal Botanical Gardens queue, and many of our museums um, are in the public sector. So we have had to, to follow um, strict um, social um, uh, government uh, government guidance on on social restrictions um, and uh, the main thing it's impacted on is on site working for our own staff and also visiting researchers um, uh, as well as uh, visitors to to our galleries to to see the, the various expedition exhibitions 
Um, so, um, and it, it has varied throughout the 18 month period that we, um, we went into strict lockdown in March 2020. Uh, there was some loosening up as the summer progressed into the autumn. And then we went into lockdown again as, as we came out of the autumn into the uh, December, January period. And now coming com gradually coming out of that again, there has been a further delay. So, uh, so what that has meant, um, certainly at the Natural History Museum, is that we have been able to go on site on a fairly regular basis to do essential checks and to do those kinds of tasks around our physical collections that uh, just have to happen to keep them safe. Um, we've also taken the opportunity to um, adapt our services so that we have um, been able to provide a click and collect type of service. We've done um, more on-site uh, digitization on demand where we've been able to. Um, but um, we, um, because of BHL and because of our own direction of travel, we had already uh, moved quite a long way along providing uh, resources electronically and our services electronically. And that really has paid off and proved that that's the right direction of travel um, because it has still enabled uh, people to carry on working. But we have had colleagues on furlough as well. Um, and the main challenge has been um, supporting uh, researchers who are on a timeline with their research projects their funding will be coming to an end. So we've had to find workarounds uh, using digital means as well as um, people going in and facilitating remote access to the physical collections, um, working remotely with, with um, people wherever they, they are based um, and using the technology um, so that uh, they have been able to complete their, their uh, student uh, dissertations, um, their funded projects. So it has been a case of uh, found, finding workarounds and exploiting what's already in place in terms of digital provision. Um, but it's, it's also um, given us a good idea of what we need to work on next uh, in terms of yes. digital provision. Yes. Thank you. Um, when I was preparing, I found the BHL also available on Flickr with many, many images in the public domain. That was really impressive. Uh, what made you choose Flickr? And, and can you say anything about the usage of those of that image bank? I mean, it's really a treasure. So I invite everybody to look closer at it. Um, well, I, I'm, I was yes, planning constant. to answer that that question, but I can't turn on my video. So um, Go ahead, we hear you. Anyway, so the, the Flickr pages, we chose Flickr because we started quite early sending our images to Flickr. And um, it, it was free and it was publicly available. And you have the option to tag images so that they can then be linked into other, other sets of images, which for us was important because we have a lot of images that, that require ta um, taxonomic names and um, you know, who, who is the artist, who, who is the author, all of those kinds of metadata that are so important in the scientific world. So that's why we chose Flickr. It was free, easy, and, and available to everybody. We currently have had, we have approximately 291,000 images in Flickr, and of those, 47,700 are tagged. And when I say tagged, I mean tagged with scientific names and ways that they can be linked to others. And as of May, there have been over 1 billion users of the Flickr images. So it's a very popular site. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, so uh, you also mentioned contextualization, that that is needed to address colonialism in older biodiversity literature. How do you work with that? I mean, uh, are you able to involve and engage with indigenous people, groups of indigenous people and national minorities? I mean, this is a very sensitive matter, I know. It, it is. Uh, and, and thank you for asking the question, actually. I did, I did um, allude to it during the talk. And, and I would say that we, we don't have all the answers yet. Um, uh, but a, a key point to, to get across, I think, is that uh, we recognise that this is, a, this is an incredibly important area. And um, it, our individual institutions are, are 
ad addressing this as well. So we're feeding in uh, the knowledge that's coming through um, wh what's happening locally. Um, but also collectively in BHL, we've been workshopping this. Um, um, uh, uh, our uh, colleagues in the BHL Secretariat organised uh, a workshop last summer. Um, it was, it was uh, if you like, a virtual internal discussion about where we thought um, that we, we need to, to put our energies um, in order to contextualise uh, the content and, and um, uh, reveal, uh, not to brush under the carpet, but reveal um, where the, there are those sensitivities. But in terms of working with wider communities, that, that has begun and, and we are um, sending out feelers um, to both the academic communities and our respective, um, if you like, local indigenous um, uh, populations to, to get their help and their input into making sure that we are adding appropriate metadata, we're using the appropriate language to um, enhance the descriptions of this content as a starting point. So an important element of our plan is to address our collections development policy um, and to identify um, uh, the, uh, the prioritised tasks to begin to address this. So it's uh, on one level, it's fairly early stages for us and we, we will be building on that work over the, the coming years. But tapping into that knowledge and expertise in other communities is, is an incredibly important element of that. And contacts have started to be made with those already working in the academic fields, um, as well as local populations. And of course, we have colleagues in Australia, uh, for example, who have already started work on this. Yeah, and I know that IFLA has working yeah. groups and, and standing committees with Indigenous mm -hmm. people and multicultural minorities and so forth. So mm -hmm. that could be a good exchange too. Thank exactly. you so much. We, we received a general question for all of you panelists, and I think maybe you, Lisa, can start uh, answering that. And it regards difficulties about digitization in libraries. Is this changing the main purpose of libraries? And as I said, it's a address to all you panelists, but Lisa, please start if you may. Yeah, thank you. Um, dig dig digitalization is a long process if it needs the metadata and all the things before, even before the process itself. And it, it takes resources and to pick collections, uh, you have to prioritize what to digitize first and, and to where to get resources and there's some limitations uh, and then we, we have to consider who are using and what what are the most important to digitize if they are vulnerable or there's a lot of users to use them they go before the uh, other stuff but there's a lot of things to take consideration when do it and this of course brings some difficulties, and uh, and if I, if I think that if the, if it's changing the um, Rome, purpose the of library, yeah, well, purpose, yeah, 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 of course it opens more opportunities to use collections of libraries and needs to think more services and for, for our case we are thinking how to form data services and services around digital collections for research purposes so there's a lot of new things to need to be considered and of course the how the users understand copyrights and, and other things that might might, might limit the you user using the collections because it's even though it um, yeah, something is digitized it 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 is not necessarily open as as the right right away because of the copyrights and copyrights and so we have to think if if we want to digitize those we cannot open then or how they can be opened. We have licensing systems in Finland that opens up uh, some materials to for research. So it's for them it's 
easier to use them, but it's not that simple. It's if there's licenses, we, we have to pay for them. So resources can use them. So that's one solution, but yeah, it changed the, somehow the role, but yes. We There's... will uh, hear from Bruno. What are your thoughts about the yes, changing very... purpose of the libraries? We're rookies in that respect, but still we're already facing some, uh, an important issue is indeed copyright. And we feel a lot that uh, because in our case, the Koopman books from the 20th century, they're so richly annotated by the user. And we cannot even think of digitizing them and put them then online because of, of of, of those restrictions. So we uh, risk creating a gray zone somewhere between the end of the old material that can be put online and the beginning of the open access era material. And, and in between there's decades of very valuable material because the, in our way, the historically informed performance movement was really something of the 20th century, in particular of the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. So a lot of pr productive and beautiful material we cannot think of putting online combined with the keywords. So that's enormously restricting. And um, it's, uh, we think it's uh, for, for books that are out of print, it is a bit on the, on the verge of ridicule almost. Yes, constant, please go ahead. <laughs> yes, I just, I just wanted to add to that and say that, um, I mean, I, I was, I was in, a, in a regular physical library before recently and, um, it was still important to maintain collections because not everything can be digitized or not everything um, when it's digitized actually um, is what the, what, what the users want. So, so it is true that digitization is changing the way we work in libraries, but it's also true that there's still a need for collections, especially archival collections. And um, so you have, you have to balance these things. It's, and, and this kind of collective approach that we've done in the BHL has been incredibly valuable to users across the world. And the pandemic just kind of um, emphasized that, that we have to have that happen. Yes. Uh, Lisa, there was more specific uh, question uh, to you uh, about if there's more about digital content available in Finland. Uh, in, of course, every um organization has their own dig digitalization process but if if you think about national library we most of our newspapers can found on digital national library.fi i put a link in the chat and 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 there's mostly newspapers and magazines that has been digitized and of course we have something else uh, in general uh, you can find something from if it um, I put in other links in chat uh, there's a like general databases where you can find we have our own national library.finna.fi but also uh, finna.fi there's there you can able to you know, search what are available. Finna works also in other institutions than just for us. But if yes. you if you're looking at our collections, that digital.nationallibrary.fi is one of the most important. It's direct address to the newspapers. But if you are interested in more widely, I suggest that Finna is the place you can find them. There you have to you use some filters and yes find by organizations and like thank that. thank you but. very much for putting it in the chat box uh, it looks like we covered all of the questions uh, thank you so much lisa constant jane and bruno is there anything else you would like to add uh, before we wrap up bruno a last word i would wish everyone good health and a, and a, and a quick return to normal life yeah, thank you, Jane and Constance. Real books. Oh, I support what Bruno's just said it totally. And thank you very much for all of your time today. It's been a, it's been a fantastic session to join. Thank you. Yes. Really and interesting. I'll, I'll second what Jane said and thank you. Yeah, Lisa. Yeah, I second with everybody. And so thank you very much. Yeah. 
it's been a true pleasure being your host or guide today. Uh, we appreciate all the 350 registrations for this session. So that shows the great interest. We will be sending all attendees a survey and uh, please fill it out so we can improve future Libra conferences. And we will also be sending a link to the recordings and the slides. Thank you again for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.